welcome everyone. Thank you for making time uh, to join us on this, our seventh in the Humanity and Healthcare Speaker Series. These ser the, the series in this session tonight will be recorded. My name is Shana Watson. I'm a family physician and also part of the planning committee. This series is rooted in personal stories linked to our shared experiences as healthcare providers and the recipients of care. We are privileged to hear people speak from the heart in this series, and this joins us together as a community and results in us understanding each other better. In this time of physical distancing, we can be affirmed in our connections to each other through listening and conversation. Before we begin, we have a little bit of uh, business. In terms of conflict of interest, I have no financial interests, nor do any other members of the planning committee, but we do bring with us the biases of our experiences and a desire to unlearn, to be able to listen and hear truth, and to be participants and advocates for reconciliation. Our time together tonight is 90 minutes. Uh, the first half will be given to Dr. Horn, uh, and the final half will be open uh, for questions and conversation. As this is a webinar format, uh, we ask that you use either the chat or the Q&A box to uh, enter questions or indicate uh, an interest in, in speaking. And we'll sort of hand you the mic um, and, and know to, to share the, the space with you that way. Uh, of course, there's a, a feedback form uh, after, and we encourage you to complete that at the end of the session. We are fortunate today to hear from Dr. Ogisto Horn. Two and a half years ago, a student contacted me and asked that he be allowed to learn with Dr. Horn and Akwesasne as part of his clinical experiences as a senior medical student. Dr. Horn was his mentor and preceptor for four months. He was welcomed by the community as he worked alongside Dr. Horn and her colleagues in what was a deeply meaningful learning experience for him as an Indigenous medical student. On Saturday, I met by Zoom with another student who had just completed a three-month placement with Dr. Horn. He shared his experiences and words of wisdom with two other Indigenous students who will be working with Dr. Horn later this year, well, one already now. He spoke to us from the dock under a clear blue sky about how sad he was to be leaving and about the value and meaning of the experience for him. As we seek to welcome Indigenous medical students into the Faculty of Health Sciences, it is essential that we offer these students opportunities to learn with and from Indigenous healthcare providers and in, in Indigenous communities. I am so grateful to Dr. Horn that she and the community of Akwesasne welcome our students and place this trust in us. We usually begin these sessions with acknowledgements, and I will just express gratitude to be a guest in this space and I will hand it over to Dr. Horn. Thank you. Um, boy, my name is uh, Ojisto Gunawaharde Horn, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge everybody here today um, to uh, spend the next hour and a half um, talking about something that is very important to me, and that is providing primary care as an Indigenous person in my own community. So I am uh, speaking from Akwazasne, Mohawk community, Haudenosaunee land. We've been here from time immemorial. And um, we share the space now with people from Ontario, Quebec, and New York State. And, um, and I recognize um, a lot of our political, a lot of our economic, a lot of our a lot of our history is deeply embedded in what is now today Canada and the United States. And, um, and so everything that I draw on is, uh, is from um, a very deep rooted um, inquiry about our past. And so I'm very thankful that we've started to acknowledge the land and the people in the places that people reside today. And so thank you for, um, for participating in a land acknowledgement. And right now we are in Akwazasne, where I am. So today I wanna to talk about uh, the, the topic, can indigenous physicians work in their own communities? So this is a picture of my mom, pregnant with my sister Gahande. 
And this is a big rock in Gahanawage, which is uh, my mom, our community near, near Montreal. And it's on the South shore, about 15 minutes from downtown Montreal. I'm the little person over on the side. I don't think I was supposed to be in the uh, picture. And this rock was there for a very long time. I'm not sure what happened to the rock because there's another rock there. But it really was a big prominent feature when you came off the Mercier Bridge to be reminded about where you are. And so that's why I think it's a fitting picture to uh, describe the land acknowledgements that we routinely hear when we are now um, having sessions like the one we're having today. So, so before we begin, like always, we must start with the first words, the words that come before all others. They're called the Ahondagari Wadekwa, and I'm not going to go through all of them with you because it could take a long time, but a very simple way so that you can understand what I'm saying. I'll first just start a little bit in Ganyankeha, but I will also finish up with English so you can understand what I'm saying. So Ganjokwa. So Wadahun Zio, Ska Nigari West, and Nagadi Ne Ahondagari Wadekwa, Anguano Hetstum. Unguesuma a guegum scan a gahage, the dam got the wardy and a gato, dog at the wanderdom. Tonio do hock no guatnigura. A guegum asca and did they what wet noon in your guatnigura than a deity knew who are other than a yet in his taha zage. Nazi sago A guegum scan a gahage, the dam got the wardy, necanto, zage. Nazi sago and I got gone haja on a hot the suit, scanner, I the one of the new sega. A guego oscon de what wet nunin and what nigura dano deity nu huradu, ne gah negardunu. Net the sego yunguaha dano wants to danscarage when a wet go sky, zage. Tonia dunhak, no what nigura, to. We get put our minds together, all is one, and we're thinking about um, about all of the people here today, and that um, and that we're all you know participating in different parts of our lives, but we all have to work together as one as we mingle amongst each other on this earth, and that we have to live in peace, and we always have to remind ourselves about that, and we give um, our acknowledgement to the earth, and we um, because she provides everything for us. Absolutely everything that we need is provided um, in her um, in her body. And um, and we should always, always remind ourselves that every day. And we acknowledge the, um, the waters, the waters which um, are from everything from Ohnega um, Umwe, um, the first waters, the amniotic fluid that we are created in, and the water that curses through our, our body in the form of blood and our sweat, and also the water that is um, on the dew every morning when uh, we wake up and it's a bit cool out, there's some dew there to feed the, um, the grasses. Um, and the water that is in all of the um, brooks and the streams and the creeks and the puddles in the uh, large waters that are um, non salty water fresh water and waters that are um, um, that are in the ice and waters that are um, that are salt waters. We always have to think about the waters. The problem is, and the good thing is, is that they actually wash away all of the negativity, all the bad stuff gets washed away and it goes somewhere else. We um, always have to think about the water and the health of our waters because that is life. And we continue on every day when we think about the Ohonda Gardi Wadakwan, that is the words that come before all others, to think about all of the different parts of creation. And quickly, that would be um, the, the, the little bugs, Odinoma Sua, and that would be uh, the no legged, the snakes, and the other two legged, the chimpanzees, the apes, the um, four legged mammals um, that we share the earth with. That would include the birds and their songs that we wake up at the very early in the morning and they remind us that they're there with each of their individual voice and, um, and how they provide comfort to us, particularly when we feel alone and we give acknowledgement to, um, to the, the grasses and, the, and those that we make into medicines, including those that have roots that we make into um, medicines so that we can, uh, that help us, that, that nourish us. And we acknowledge um, the plants that we've domesticated into um, foods that we can eat, and those would include our three sisters, the corn, the beans, and the squash. And we think about, um, 
about our first, um, our first, um, the most important berry, a berry of all would be like the strawberry and in the shape of a heart. And it's the, uh, the most important one we say the, it, it, that it's the first. We um, acknowledge the trees. Right now we're acknowledging Wahta, which would be the tree that provides the sap when the, um, when the winter is finished and you have the running of the sap. We would have used that sap to clean our bodies and to nourish ourselves um, but also to clean out anything that was not supposed to be there, like a parasite having, you know, been inside all, all cold winter. Um, so we acknowledge the trees and that they keep doing what they're supposed to be doing, um, what they were put on the earth with an in original instruction, and we, and we acknowledge that. We acknowledge um, the, um, the, the winds that come from all different directions, providing a different tone. We um, acknowledge the, um, the, the rains that it brings them and the thunders and the lightning that come with it. The lightning came about, about three or four weeks ago where it woke up the earth to start a new year. Um, we acknowledge the um, we acknowledge um, our, our great um, brother, the sun, who um, like a very, very trustworthy um, brother, big brother gets up and wakes us up every day and makes sure that we are warm and that it provides all of the sustenance for us to be able to live here. Because of course, if you didn't show up, we wouldn't be here. We um, acknowledge our grandmother, the moon, how she is our grandmother, but she also in our creation story is the sister of, of um, our son. And she, um, and she provides um, the um, requirements for fertility so that we have um, cycles. And um, one of the cycles that she just went through um, about a week ago, she, she stayed around in the sky long enough for her brother, the sun to come up. And they were both in the sky at the same time to uh, greet each other. And uh, we give our thanks. Um, and, and of course, she watches over all of us, all of our children and all of, of all of the different parts of creation um, over the night. night. Um, and we give our thanks to the um, the, the, the stars, um, the stars in the sky, which led us to where we were going. And some of us feel like they are our ancestors, especially that road along the Milky Way. Um, we also um, rem are reminded that they are there to, um, to support and act like a blanket over the, um, over our, uh, our grandmother, the moon. And finally, we think about um, the great big mind that's inside nature. So Oyerda Negaza sponsored at Goa, the great big mind that exists that made all of this happen something that we could never ever even describe fully which we try to do in science but something that we've observed we give thanks to um the, the creator who's part of the um who's part of the creation story and his brother um who helped make everything the way that we see it today. We give thanks to their grand, um, to their, um, to uh, Sky Woman, to Jijizu, who uh, eventually became the, the moon. But what we do thank is all of these celestial beings that we have right now in our sky and who've been here since entire humanity. And so we can all think about um, all of the parts of nature and when we think about them, we realize it gives us intention as to why we're here. And it reminds us that we are um, actually very small. So I am um, I'm a, a Mohawk or Haudenosaunee and um, we're not really known for, you know, great big, um, really interesting um, things like um, teepees or, you know, interesting big wild hunting wild game like hunting buffalo or living in, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean teepees, I meant totem poles and living in teepees and things like that. We're not known for those kind of things. Those, but what did survive was our ability to um, communicate with people and our ability to set intention, even when you were very full of emotion and angry. That's what we're known for. And it's um, outlined in one of our great stories um, of Daganawida, who is our, um, who would be somebody who brought the great law of peace to our people. So this is a depiction here on the left hand side. It's uh, in Anshiota, there's a small museum there. Um, and it's about, and this particular one talks about um, the great law of peace in Daganawida. And, um, and out of that came the Confederacy of the Iroquois people, which is here um, outlined with the wampum belt of the uh, five nations or Hiawatha belt. And the reason I like to bring this um, to your attention is that the, um, is that our great law of peace has a lot 
lot of instructions as to how we should interact with one another so that we can keep the peace, so that we can make really good decisions without bringing emotion into them. And one of the things that I always grew up um, knowing or understanding was the idea that if you had two people who did not understand something and were very, very opposite in their thinking, that they would sit together and for a very long time discuss what they were talking what, what the, the situation was. And they would talk and they talk and they leave and come back and talk eventually to the point that one side could successfully argue the point of view of that other person and that they could successfully argue our point of view. And so in the end, you come up with a um, with an understanding, but you also came up with a decision that was probably a little bit more syncretic or in the middle. And so that is a really big part of learning how to get along with another. You really have to spend time um, talking and making relationships and really listening. And when I say really listening, it brings me to something else. It's called the small condolence ceremony. And so another thing is when you come into a situation and you're bringing all all that baggage with you from your day. Maybe you stubbed your toe or you're, you know, you gotten, uh, you ran out of gas or some big thing happened and, you know, you come into your meeting and you're just frazzled. You've had a bad morning or not and things are going on in your life. Well, with the small condolence, what you do is you um, just sort of remove that from you. And then when you sit down, you say, we take the, um, we take the, the deer hide and we wipe our eyes with the deer hide so that we can see and really, really see what's going on. Not just what be, what's being said, but you can actually see the body language. Um, when you, um, and then we take um, a feather and we clean out our ears. So the things that we're hearing are real. They're not, they, they, they are, that we don't, aren't fooled by um, any innuendo that comes out in, um, in the, um, in the, in the voice versus the words. And then of course we have some water, which we drink and it cleans the throat so that when you speak, you have kind words, that you have words of optimism and, um, and, uh, and reconciliation. So when we speak, um, we do the small, con when, we, when we enter in a, into a conversation, we bring these principles of the small condolence. We bring the idea of being able to talk to the point that we could successfully argue somebody else's point and we do it with the intention that we're trying to make a really, really important decision based on the principles of the seven generations. And that would mean that, that whatever decision we decide today is going to affect those people seven generations down the line. So the, one of the ways that we talk about the seven generations would be um, in your lifetime, you can't see or know everything. You can't be part of everything. However, if you... Um, However, if you have really good relationships with the people around you, you will expect to understand vicariously um, the, um, um, or to live vicariously through the lives of those people around you. And so that would include those of your peers, your mother and father and their peers, your grandparents' peers. And if you're very lucky, you would have lived to interact with your great grandparents. And similarly, as you go through life, you see your children, your children's children, and then your great grandchildren. So that's seven generations of an experience that you can bring with good relationship into any decision. And so those are the fundamental um, principles of the Gayardet Goa and the way that we interact as um, Haudenosaunee or Iroquois people. But one thing I want to talk about is the life cycle. Now we know that um, every, every we always talk about Indigenous people as understanding the life cycle um, as being circular, and um, and so the reason I want to talk to you about this particular basket is because right now I'm in the life cycle of um, passing from uh, motherhood and fertility to menopause, and why is that important? I mean there are seven um, great big life uh, cycles that we go through as human beings. We go through conception. We go through through birth, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and which includes marriage and having your own children. And then we go through menopause and then we go through death. 
So when you're going through um, your, your young motherhood, you have this big basket and you fill it all, like there's a basket for each life, um, part of the life cycle. But as you go into motherhood and you have this great big basket that looks a lot like the, the mom's purses that we have today, and you keep filling it with all of your, your, um, your children's stuff, and then the children grow up, you don't need that basket anymore. And then you go through menopause, you take all that stuff out and you start to put it in all of your reflections, all of your insights, all of the way that you see things, your wisdom and your job as a person with this particular basket is to teach. And that is actually why I'm here today. And that's why I have um, students come to the community in Okazasne to learn because right now I'm carrying this basket. It's to teach. So we're talking about working in our communities um, as um, Indigenous uh, physicians, but Indigenous healing is not something that just came out um, just like, you know, with uh, Western medicine. We have a very long history of understanding medicines. Um, and that goes like even in my own family here. So this is my father's mother, the little girl. And my father's mother's mother was named Sagagohe um, Jacobs Montour. She lived in Ganawage and she understood medicines. Just like a lot of the women at the time um, would carry on the medicines for the, uh, the family and for the community. Um, she, her brother was one of our first doctors, Western trained in the community named um, Dr. Jacobs, also from Ganawage. On my mother's side, we have Gahandinetha, who my mother is named after, and this is her grandmother. And she was um, incredibly knowledgeable about the medicines. People um, came from all over, the, over, all over, including Montreal, to come and see her. And she would listen to what they needed, would go out, pick the medicines, make them something. And, um, and that's what she was known for. Beside her is my, uh, my mother's grandfather, Peter Horn, and he um, understood um, bone setting. So he, with a group of other men from Gahnawagi, were chosen to go down to one of the big universities in the United States. And they stayed there for, for a year and learned how to set bones, like an orthopedist. And um, he came back and that's what, what he did. Uh, my grandfather, the little guy at the bottom, is my mother's father, and he was uh, very knowledgeable in, um, in, well, they all were actually, in, um, in uh, preserving our traditions, our culture. In, so that not just included um, health and wellness, but also political health and wellness and spiritual health and wellness. My Auntie Goji Cook is, um, is uh, living here in Okwazasne. That's my father's younger sister. She's a midwife. Um, she's a teacher. She worked over at Ithaca with, at Cornell. And she was also one of the strong proponents and original people involved in the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives. Sagagohe Cook Pambleton is my dad's older sister. She was the director of health. She had the conception of providing primary care to community members. And she worked on the Northern and the Southern side, that is on the Canadian and the American side of Ogwazasne. Very, very um, aware of the importance of providing traditional medicine in, um, in, the, um, in, the, um, in, the, in, in, in primary care. So I went to medical school with knowing that I had all of these people in my background who were doctors, um, who were traditional medicine people, who were midwives, who were directors of health. You know, I had all of that behind me. So when I went, I didn't feel like I was the first of anything to do to do this. And I went to University of British Columbia and I was a very shy person. Um, and I only asked two questions and they were the same question. And the question was, um, in both cases, um, it happened when I was in a class. Um, and of course, you know, you've got the big auditorium with, you know, 120 students. And um, the question after hearing the, um, the, the, the teacher talk about how, as, as doctors, we cannot work in our families, with our families. We cannot work with people um, and, and provide medical care to people that we know. And that there's this, there's this very important wall that exists that we have to maintain as doctors. So I thought, well, that's very interesting because how am I going to do that when I plan to go back to Ganawage and practice medicine as a family doctor? So I put up my hand both times, asked that same question, and both times was told, well, we don't actually know. I don't have a precedent to talk about. I don't know. And one of the teachers actually said, well, why don't you try that and come back and let us know? <laughs> so here I am. And that's what I have reflected on 
um, um, for the last uh, 14 years of working. Now, when I moved home to Ganawage, I, um, I had run into, um, run into one of the former doctors from um, Ganawage, a family doctor named Louis T. Montour. And I saw him and he was sitting there kind of just enjoying, enjoying the moment. And I said, Louis T, I have something to ask you. I want to sit down. I have so many questions to ask of you. And I said, but you know what? I don't know what those questions are, but I know I need to talk to you. I know I need some, I need to ask you. And really what I was talking about was how do you provide medical care in our community as because you come from here? And he smiled and he said, okay, I'll be here. But unfortunately he developed cancer and he died. And I was never able to talk to him about the very, very important question that I had been asking myself and of other people. How do you provide medical care to your own people? So when I moved back to Gunawage after medical school and residency, I uh, was a really, really busy doctor. I had a huge scope of um, medicine. I, pr I practiced on, in the community general family medicine. I did prenatal. I delivered a lot of babies. I was a hospitalist at the, um, the nearby um, adjacent, in the adjacent community. Um, I was a hospitalist. I worked in the ER. I was also teaching family medicine residents from McGill University. I had my own group of patients in the geriatric ward and I did a lot of palliative care. So I would be what you would consider a full scope family doctor. And you know, I was so, so busy that I did not even realize that I was fully engaging in a Western form of providing care. I um, was really, really um, not aware that I was functioning no differently than my colleagues down the hallway. And so what does that mean? That means that I was functioning like I had been trained. However, the people who came to see me saw me differently and they started to talk in those sessions. And over the years, I learned that there is a discourse, a public discourse that happens right on the surface that is talked about in the open and public spaces. And it is the part that's in, in, um, in the newspapers and the stuff that's talked to, to the media. And then below that, there's another level of discourse. And then below that, there's another level of discourse. And I was right down at the lowest level of discourse because people were talking to me about things that were happening in the community. And I, um, and I was, um, and I was um, just putting it all together because I was hearing about it from so many people. But at the same time, I couldn't say anything about it because, well, these were being, these, this information was coming from um, very privileged spaces. And so I could not talk about them and things were coming up and I was unable to, um, to, have, um, to have anything to say about anything. I had to be very, very quiet. So the reason I have the set of moccasins here is because it's really important to recognize that um, we have something called the moccasin telegraph in which um, the everybody knows everything in the community and there's very little confidentiality that happens. So it's really hard to maintain confidentiality when you work in a place like that. You have to be very, very vigorous and remove yourself from your community discourse to maintain that confidentiality. Now, a long time ago, that moccasin telegraph would have been, um, I guess you could say, um, monitored by the elder women in the community who would basically know everything. But now we have lost the ability of our elder women to be able to monitor that because it's been, um, it's been um, supplanted by social media and the fact that we have such a large community these days. So all of that stuff that talked about in the community now is at a different level and it's really, really violent it in some cases and that um, there's a lot of hurt that can happen and there's no way that we can monitor or hold it, uh, people accountable because of the way things are um, with social media today. So when I went to go back to work, there were three things I wanted to uh, just uh, let you know about. My mom, Gahandi Horn, was one of um, the very, um, very 
original outspoken female figures in Canada and I would say in North America talking about Indigenous health, um, the health of our people, but particularly our women. And because of that, um, uh, because of the way that she um, would bring these to the um, forefront, it was very, very much against um, the men who were part of the establishment, which is the band council. And so these people, when I started working in Gahnawag, um, I became their doctor and I knew things that they had done and said and hurt um, my family, myself, and that's not the reason we're here to talk about. But it, what it means is that I went back to work and had to take care of people that, um, that I um, really um, had a hard time doing so. So I had to be very, very professional to try and overcome some of the, um, um, the history that had elapsed between me and some of these people. Also, we have a problem with, um, with prescription medications. When I was there, we were um, actively working on Oxyneo, Oxycontin, and I used to hold a, um, a walk-in clinic. And at this walk-in clinic, there were always these people, these sharks who would wait, and it would be nine, 10 o'clock, and I would be sitting in my room finishing. And I would look out and I'd see there was always a group of people wanting to get more medication. And there was this one time where the same man over the same number of weeks came and wanted more of his medication. And I told him that I could not, having already done it the week before. And he said, okay, then, well, I just want you to know that I know where your children go to school and I know where you live. And I thought, oh my goodness, because I was being threatened. And I have no idea why I didn't just march over to the security guard and pick up the phone and talk to the cop. But I basically stopped doing walk-in cl clinic. And that was because of the direct, um, the direct um, threatening um, remarks against my family, my children. And, um, and so um, that I know happens. Um, and I know that maybe the reason I didn't do that is because I didn't have a lot of faith that he was, um, anything was going to happen um, to him. There is a lot of problems with policing in our communities. And, um, and I think that's what, what happened here. The other thing that happened in our community at that time um, was this burgeoning problem, this burgeoning issue about different individuals who, um, who were not with Mohawk people. They were with non-native people who um, were um, who obviously weren't weren't on the, the ban list, and that would be like what we would consider a white person, but also there were people from different communities who were considered, you know, not from here. They were, and so there was this huge amount of energy um, that went into um, um, finding these people. And there was this big list that came out of 200 people, of which my one of my sisters, Wanique, who is on the on the call today, um, was on that list as number two on the list for somebody to um, to have to um, to have to leave the community. And a little bit of background. Around, she met her um, her then boyfriend Keith Morgan at the Olympics when she went um, to Sydney in um, in 2000, and um, and she actually met somebody who understood the way that she thinks and and is and her drive, and and fell in love with him. She wasn't able to find that back home on the reserve. And when he finished his fourth Olympics, that is after Sydney, after competing for Canada as a judoko in judo, um, at, at Sydney, Atlanta, Greece, Beijing, he finally decided to stop um, um, being a judoko, to stop um, um, the sport, and then he decided to go to medical school. And so he was gone. He was already in medical school far away when this whole thing happened. And there was this effort that I think is part because the fact that um, she was um, with him, but I think in part it was had to do with these residual feelings against my mom. And so um, it was a very complicated situation. And uh, it was a big, big part of my life story. So here we have um, a number of uh, beautiful pictures that were done of my, my sisters and my mom. So going from the top, my mom's name is Gahande Neta. There's myself, there's my sister Gahande. She's right now working in Ottawa. She's at Carleton University, she's a professor. Then the, below her is my sister Wani Cornmiller and she was the person I'm talking about who was on the list to be evicted. And then my other sister, Vignette Dio Horn, who is an actor. And the reason I have this here 
is because each of us has our own story about what happened during the evictions. I will say that Wanique um, had the, the, the by far the most um, biggest brunt of it in which she was directly, um, was directly threatened her life and that of her baby and her house um, because um, by these mobs who would gather and were very, very uh, insulting, derogatory, threatening with Molotov cocktails. It was a horrific time to be in our community and uh, depending on what side of the fence you were on and um, and and so there were meetings. I remember one particular meeting where I was at where one person after another in a band meeting of about 500 people would stand up and just put my sister down and I sat beside her and I looked at these people and realized that for the most part they were my patients and I would felt just so mixed because I had put so much care and love and professionalism into trying to take care of my own people and here they were and um, and it wasn't reciprocated. So my sister Gohande, um, actually, so when he ended up leaving the community, my sister Gohande, in her support of my sister, started to get a lot of um, negative um, blow, um, blowback. And so she ended up leaving her positions at McGill and Concordia and went to uh, Carleton University in Ottawa. And then there was myself, Vignette Dio was uh, um, working, um, but there was myself and I would go to work and I would see these people. And one day I was working um, with a particular person and my sister Gohande called me and she said, are you, are you seeing somebody right now? Is there somebody, or did you just see somebody? And she described a situation in which a patient was starting to, patients actually, were starting to say, we're gonna get her um, license. And they started to say things that, we, that apparently had happened in the confines of our um, office. And I could not, um, and I couldn't defend myself. I couldn't say that didn't happen because I would be breaching confidentiality. And so I was so struck because it was so obvious and open. And so I left the, the, I left my office, I went outside, I called the CMPA and they said, my goodness, let's talk to our lawyers. They talked to their lawyers and they reported back to me and they said I had to leave. And I was very surprised. So there I was having worked there six years and suddenly being told that I couldn't stay anymore. It was a very, very difficult thing for me to, uh, to go through because what really happened was that throughout this entire um, situation, I had no voice. We are expected as family doctors, as doctors, to have this incredibly loud voice that people will listen to. But actually in communities like where I come from, um, it's a very complicated thing. And depending on what the situation is, we actually don't have a voice. There were people who were coming into my clinic and I could not help them even though I knew that there was wrong being done because I didn't have any voice against the band council or the police and I had people who were, there were the haves and the have nots, people who could not get services and I could not help them even though I was so educated and so connected and all of these things. And so it was a, it was this um, really, really difficult um, pill to swallow having been told that one day I would be able to have a very strong voice. So this is something that I made of myself when I left. It's a, a plaster and I had never done this before. It was quite a, an interesting um, 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 project. But in there, obviously I have a mask on, which now that we're in COVID seems very um, not, so, um, not so stark or, or, or um, unsettling. Um, but the pictures um, are all of, of the people and the people even though I was a people, I was from the community, I was part of the community, I actually couldn't speak on behalf of community members because of what had just happened. And so it was a very, very sad time for me and I went through a profound burnout. So when I left, I ended up finding my way to Aguazasne, which is my father's community. And I went back to basics. I stopped doing all of those really interesting types of medicine and started doing outpatient medicine. I started running. This is a picture I took one morning while I was running because I like to run just as the sun changes over into, um, into the daytime. Actually, this one is at night. And I, uh, my sister, this is me kissing her baby. These are all my children. And, um, you know, went back to ceremony, went back to, um, 
um, language, went back to the longhouse, went back to basics, went back to um, trying to be the most balanced person that I could be because I hadn't been able to do that in all the time that I had worked, in the time that I had done residency, medical school, the master's degree before that. I mean, the last time that I felt balanced had been when I was a young person. So I went back to basics. And so over the next few years, um, as I got myself better, um, I, um, I realized, um, well, actually, because I couldn't pass the French exam, I was working with a temporary license. And um, one of the caveats of having a temporary license is that if you continue, if you work as a doctor teaching medical students from McGill, you don't have a time limit with which they will withdraw your temporary license if you can't pass the exam. And so what happened was I said, well, I guess I'm going to have to start teaching again. And so I started, um, I started thinking about how to do this. Now, in Aguazasne, at the same time, in a matter of a few months, the three doctors who'd been working there for 25 years all retired. And suddenly I was left um, as the only physician in the community. So how do you have um, a, um, how do you have um, family medicine? Um, how do you do medical, how do you have medical students come to your community and learn when you're the, uh, the only doctor? There were um, other doctors like um, who were visiting like um, an endocrinologist and Dr. Saylor, a, a pediatrician. But as far as family medicine was concerned, um, there, that, that was it. So now we talk about um, the um, the the um, the barriers with which to provide um, primary care in our communities. Um, when I was trying to figure out the best way to provide care, um, I mean to provide a learning environment for my medical students and residents. Um, I realized that because being on my own, I couldn't do that by myself, but I could if I elicited the, um, the help of all the people that I was working with, that I had learned to work with over the previous three years. And that were people who like, well, the dent, the non-doctor um, prof health professionals, like the dentist, the pharmacist, the, op um, the optometrist, and then the other nurses, like those who did diabetes care, home care, those who, and then of course the long-term care health professionals, professionals, and then um, the nurse practitioners who worked there, and then the community members like those who, um, who provided teachings about, um, about, um, about the history, teaching the Mohawk language, and of course our traditional medicine practitioners who um, were the ones that I was trying so hard to align with because I felt that they were the ones who I could um, work best with because that was actually what my original intention had been so long ago that I had forgotten at that time. So I tried to do that. I uh, had a whole team of us working together and um, we all worked together and it really, it, it really did work. Um, but there was always problems with sustainability. And that's because of the way that the Indian Act is set up and the way that healthcare is set up in our communities. Our communities are um, under the federal um, governments. They have, into, into every, every community has a different relationship with the federal government as to how services are going to be um, met in the communities. And so um, for instance, um, it's a very administrative bureaucratic, um, 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 what we would call a, um, a um, I'm sorry, a very, um, uh, well, it's not a standard of care, but um, a strategic plan. It was a very bureaucratic strategic plan based on budget and finances. And so everything is in its own um, pillars and they don't communicate they, because that's um, very complicated. And so um, what I was finding as I was going through trying to make things more efficient, I couldn't break through all of these pillars because of the underlying way that everything is um, organized in, um, in um, primary care in our communities. You know, there's an emerging um, generation of, a, of, um, of what we call um, a hybridized uh, knowledge keepers that come from deep tradition who really understands how, um, how um, um, we used to take care of ourselves. 
and they've gone to school and they have become medical, um, medical um, doctors and nurses and other allied health professionals. And we have uh, the two row wampum in which we're supposed to keep both things, always be reminded that we are supposed to work side by side with um, the people who are not us and to um, work um, sort of cognizant of each other, but go down um, the river of life together um, as per the two row wampum treaty. However, when you are a hybrid, hybrid and you are, you're actually jumping in from one boat to the other, which is a deeply unsettling thing. Um, but the way that I've come to realize it is that I'm actually a traditional minded person who um, understands Western medicine. And I understand when my patients need to go and get traditional medicine or traditional um, wraparound services. I'm a family physician and family physicians, we are uniquely capable and we are taught to take care of people as they pass from every part of the life cycle. Like I said, they go through um, conception and, and birth and childhood, adolescence, um, young adulthood, menopause and andropause, and then, um, and then death. And so we are at every single point along that continuum. But we have also, um, we also have traditional ways, ceremonies, um, which, um, which reestablish the connections to help people go through these really important stages of life. And so to me, I see family medicine and traditional holistic medicine as having the same goal. Um, and we in the middle are able to hop between them. So the question here is, who are you accountable to? As a family physician, we're accountable to, um, I would say the CFPC, because that's where we get our licensure from the different colleges that we get our licensure um, in, the different pro um, in, in the different provinces. Um, we have you know, CMEs that we have to do. I mean, there are certain things that we, we need to do as family doctors. When you're a community family physician, who are you accountable to, especially if you're in a rural place and you know the people, especially if you grew up there. I'm not talking Indigenous, I'm talking just a, a rural medicine, which has really recently been um, found to be its, um, I mean, there's a lot of energy to, to, to recognize that it is its own specialty. And then you have the Indigenous community family physician. So that's a family physician working in an Indigenous community. And I would, I would say that um, we are accountable to uh, different things in, um, in each um, realm. But if you're an Indigenous community, Indigenous family physician, that's something altogether different. And, um, and that's why I'm trying to convey the importance of understanding um, our um, understanding, our culture, and our our um, our ceremonies um, to help people through these stages in their life. You know, um, I want to share a story. I was trying to think about how I could actually demonstrate what I'm trying to say because it is very difficult to try and convey. I had a patient, and she had been in a um, in a semi-vegetative state for many years, and uh, was clearly not getting better. And she was, um, and she required a lot of care, but she was comfortable and probably could have, um, you know, lived many more years. And the family was just um, so devastated with um, recognizing that she was never going to um, meet all of those hopes and dreams that they had for her while she was um, growing up. And so um, they, and so there was this vigil that went on for years to, um, to take care of her. And then finally, the family realized, especially her mother, that it was time, time to let her go through the next phase of her cycle, of her life cycle. And so when that happened, I asked her, I, I wanted to know what kind of, um, people she needed to help her. And I recognized that she may have not been an actively traditional person, but that this young person was, and so were people in the family, but otherwise they didn't have any um, real, you know, ideas as to what they needed. And so 
Um, I asked for permission. I organized. Um, I got the people aware that when we needed this somebody to come in to help, that um, that they would be ready and on call. And sure enough, um, we um, stopped um, providing her her um, her feeds through her peg tube. We stopped providing her um, the other comforts and to keep her alive as well. We kept her comfortable, but we stopped doing things to keep um, her alive. And about a week later, she. Started started to have very thick mucus plugs. And then I started to actively help her with her um, comfort and um, which we call comfort care. And, um, and at that time I recognized she was, it was time. And so all of the family were called in as was the traditional medicine person. And, and everybody was so upset. There was so much energy because this has been something they've been, you know, slowly walking towards for so long. And here it was. And they came into the room and he gave her a wampum to put in her hand and he talked to her. And he talked to her about her body and her spirit and her, um, and her mind and her emotions. And he talked about her life. And over the course of him talking to her, the energy in the room just sort of, it just, it just went down and it was very calm. And then when it was done and the words were finished, he took the wampum from her and I said to, um, I said to my medical student, I said, okay, now let's go and, um, and give the family some space. And, um, and we were just down the hallway and she died. So we came back, we pronounced her. And then the next part of the, the, the ceremony happened in which the traditional person was talking to her spirit. And so when it was all over, he had managed to change the entire energy in that room from extreme heightened anxiety to acceptance and calmness. And it was a beautiful, beautiful transition to see that I don't think I could have ever done, but our traditional people can do this. And we see this at the most extremes of life during birth and death. And that is why it's so important to have doulas and midwives participating at the beginning of life and doulas and traditional people and I would argue family doctors to work at the end of our lives. And um, I wanted to um, thank you all for coming here today and listening to me. I don't know how much time I took, but I appreciate your um, patience. And I'm sure I missed something that I really wanted to tell you. I have quite a few friends who are on the call right now. And if they um, have something that, um, that they know I forgot, I would appreciate them um, bringing their voice to the table. Of course, my family's here. And if there's anything that I may have said that was not um, correct, um, I would ask them to also come and, um, and bring their voice to the table. I thank you very much. Yeah. We, we have uh, space for for the people who are the invited guests uh, and and panelists uh, if they if they would like to speak and if other participants um, would like to make comments uh, or re request to be uh, given given the, the microphone to, to speak um, now now you you may do that. So how do we do this? Hi, James. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Yes. Okay. So I'd like to, um, did you answer the question? Can a Indigenous doctor from the community, raised in the community, practice in their community? Thank you. No, I didn't. We can, I knew I forgot something important. We are able to work in our communities if we are supported and surrounded by like-minded health professionals that are not necessarily doctors, but a team of people all working to provide wraparound services to our people, including traditional medicine people. 
because what happens is we become, um, um, we're allowed to be empathic, we're allowed to feel, but it's in a safe place and we don't become burnt out and we're able to, um, and we're able to um, not be above anybody so that we become the focus of lateral violence that happens in our communities. Um, so we can, if we work as a team at home in, in that particular space, yes. Otherwise, if we go in there as a Western chain doctor, we have a bullseye on our back it's really, really hard to work in that situation. And we are so busy that we don't have time for self-care. So I would say that if we are to move back into our communities and work, we need to work um, from the, with the community, not by ourselves. Did that answer the question? Perhaps you, um, some of the other doctors on the call who are working in their communities could, could help answer that question as well. Hi, <laughs> I was having some technical difficulties. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what I did. I clicked something and voila, I, I popped onto the screen and I could only see a few people. Um, but thank you very much, Ogisto, for raising this uh, very important question. Um, because for me, I guess it comes also from many sides, like having um, the college tell us that we can't take care of our own families. And, and yet there's, when you're, we're working in our own communities, we, we are taking care of our own families and, and cousins and relatives and neighbors and people we've known since we were little kids, you know? Um, so um, I think that has to be looked at at that level and an understanding has to be developed about the work that we do in our communities. Um, I know for me personally, when I went to medical school, it was specifically to return to my own community. That is why I went. And a lot of our people, when we go to medical school or nursing or whatever, it's because we have a plan to come back home. And oftentimes what I have found and in my mind and, and what, I've, from my, what I've learned, I. I think it's a fallout of how health services have been um, implemented in First Nations communities anyways. In, I'm in Ontario at Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, but I found that you know my community were very supportive. They were like, yay, glad you're going to med school, so wonderful. And then when I graduated and came back to work, the treatment is just like horrible. Um, there's no, and, and what I recognized is that the, the healthcare within First Nations communities is not really a system. It's been just a bunch of health centers that are plunked down. They're delivered in a very Western way for the most part, um, you know, other than those people who have tried to um, include cultural knowledge, traditional knowledge, traditional medicine. It tends to be very, um, because it comes from that administrative point of view, right? And it's very nurse focused. And so when physicians come back and you're coming into your own community, there's, they don't really have an understanding of how um, my community didn't have an understanding of really what my role was as a physician. Not only that, they didn't have a good understanding of what is primary care because I remember having the council sort of surround me in this room and they were just frantic and they were like, why won't you let us do this? Why can't you run a clinic right here? The cleaning lady could be the nurse. Like, and the, in the place we were in, the walls didn't even go up to the ceiling. <laughs> and I was like, um, for many reasons, right? But they, it, and to me, what, what I, I came to, for, in a spiritual sense after, after I really prayed a lot about it and spent the time figuring out what this was, is that this wasn't about me. This didn't really have anything to do with me as a person. I'm, I'm not that important. It's that we don't have a way to receive physicians back. And so the perception was that I was trying to take over. If I had an idea or if I said, this is what I learned, 
and this is what I learned and this is what I'm bringing back. You know, I had people say to me, well, you're not the director. You're not the, you know, and I'm like, I don't want to be the, <laughs> I just want to be the doctor. Right. So, um, and I think a lot of that has to do with how health service has not been a system and it has not been a system that is founded on our own knowledge because the other thing that happened in my case was we did set up a clinic um, with a linkage to the traditional medicine people. Um, they had come forward to me when I graduated and they basically, they said, we've been watching you and we were ready to engage with the Western system now and we wanna work with you. And so I said, okay, tell me what you want me to do. And I did what I was told. I didn't alter it or change it. I just did it. And the community, meaning the band council was supportive of that until we got to a place where it was really going to happen, where we were actually really going to have traditional knowledge, traditional medicine, right at the forefront, right in, this is primary care because my philosophy has been that the role of a physician at the center of healthcare in indigenous communities is a stolen position. It was, you know, the physician role was put there through colonization. So my goal was always to rebalance that. But as soon as we got to that place, the band council said, you know what, if you're going to do that, here's your papers, you got to go. And we're going to actually consider the day that you brought that up to your team as the day you resigned. And I was asked to leave a, a family health team that I set up, primary care that I helped arranged, that I got the funding for. So then I was asked to move on. So I think it has to go back to all of those levels that um, healthcare is, or primary care specifically, family medicine, everybody has a role and an accountability to play here in how to improve the situation. Because what we do know is when I did leave council and I, I was like, okay, fine. And the traditional medicine people and I just kept right on going with no funding, no support. We just kept on going. And then I did a research, uh, I got a research grant to look at that model of care. And what it showed is that when you bring the traditional knowledge together with the Western knowledge, and we learn how to heal the relationship that exists between the medical system and our traditional system through our personal relationships that our people heal. How do they heal? They start to develop self-determination in their own lives and in their own health, which is what we need. That's what colonization has done to us. It's diminished that for us. So we know that this is what's needed. And this is how Indigenous physicians need to be able to work if we're supported to do that, like Ogisto said. Now. Thank you. Uh, I, see, I see two people, <clears throat> panelists with hands. Um, Kanahanti, I'm sorry, I'm not saying your name correctly. I'm really sorry, I should have. <laughs> uh, but if you could speak next. Sure, uh, thank you very much, it's Kahande. I'm sorry, thank you. Um, so the ideal, of course, in any Indigenous community is to have all Indigenous doctors. And I know you mentioned and, and you discussed very briefly some of the work that you're doing with uh, the, Queen's, the Queen's McGill and Ottawa U students that come in, that ask to come into the community. Um, I wanted to know, as a, as a physician within your own community, what... What is, what is the key thing that, that you'd like them to know so that if they decide to come back and work in community that they can, um, but also what is your role? What do you see as your long-term role in terms of doing this kind of work with doctors that are from outside the community? And, and what, what would a system, sorry, just it's a three-part question. I'm making it really difficult for you. <laughs> Um, is that what, what kind of a system needs to be in place that can accommodate Indigenous physicians from their own communities and non-Indigenous physicians from outside the community? So, so it's a three-part question that looks at that holistic view of what you're doing. 
So I think the biggest, most important thing is to know who you're accountable for, to, to know what, um, to know what space you're holding. So if you don't have, um, you know, community cred, which is like a community credentials, people don't know you, that's okay. That's okay. It's not everybody who um, grew up in a community and they grew up in the city and that's okay. But it's important to recognize that. And if you find yourself in a position because there's nobody else and you're like, okay, I'll stand here and I will speak for um, what I know. Recognize what your limitations are and who you're speaking for and what you know and your experiences and wait and hope that somebody else is gonna come along with a better voice, a stronger voice, a more appropriate voice to take that position and then you relinquish it. And so right now, when we're talking about primary care in our communities, we do need to um, recognize that not everybody is going to have that uh, specific knowledge to be able to answer the really important questions. But we have people who can open the door and let those people in to be able to have a voice. And so really we don't need bench warmers, but we need people who will allow other people to play the game. So there's room for everybody because we all, we ha it's such a huge issue and we have so much need. We need everybody, but we also need people to recognize their limitations. We're great at doing that with family doctors. We know when we need help and we consult. It's the same idea. We know when, um, when, um, so as if what I'm saying here is we should know what our limitations are and then consult to the people that do know. Thank you. Veronica was the next up. And after Veronica, um, Rupa is the next person on the speakers list, but Veronica. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Adjusto. I mean, you hit so many of the pieces, I think that really resonated with me. I think a couple of points that I wanted to bring forward and highlight was, I, first off, there are very few Indigenous physicians still to this day, particularly those physicians that actually come from community and practice their, practice their traditional cultural ways. So it's such a unique gift that you bring to the communities. But the reality is there is lateral violence. There is that piece of colonization of internalized racism. And in particular, I think a lot of misogyny against women, you know, as Indigenous women, we know like we are targets. That's the reality of it. Um, but I think, you know, there's so many pieces too that are demanding of you when you are practicing in community. And I see that in what you're what you've been talking about and saying, you know, it's not just the day-to-day -day clinical practice it's you know when your auntie calls up or when you know somebody comes to your door these things are always always around you and even going to different ceremonies or different things there are always those that will be around you to to kind of try to get some information and and you know you're there for them and it's because you know we bleed for our communities we see the pain we see all of these things and we see ways that we could be helpful but it, it's almost like you can get burnt into the ground sometimes, aside from all of the other things that you've mentioned. So I just, I really thank you so much for all the great work that you do and the leadership that you show and all that you give. And you do it so gracefully and beautifully. So thank you. Hi, hi to that. Yes. Thank you. Um, Rupa? Um, oh, hi there. Uh, thank you for the talk. And it's a really important topic. Um, my question was about uh, just the sort of the gender issue and the misogyny that was just remarked upon too, because I see that the, there is this male dominated male centric style of leadership um, in the uh, indigenous communities. And I wonder about that because when you visit, you see all the, the aunties doing all the work. And it's like, wait a minute, why aren't they in charge? So I don't know how that has played into your experience, um, but I think that might compound uh, the experience that you had. So you know, I, I would say can... that um, when I talk about my mom, the reason I talk about her is because she is um, our biggest role model. When she used to talk about um, murder, like um, the, um, the women, for instance, in Vancouver on the downtown east side, who were being prostituted as children, 
to people, to men in Vancouver, mostly white men. Um, and when she brought that out, rather than listen to her, she, would be, they, she was attacked and they sexualized everything part of her and she couldn't say anything without being um, demonized and sexualized. And so, and that, and so that's, the, that's what they do to women is that they will do that to you. And, and it comes in the weirdest, um, weirdest ways because we do it to ourselves. Um, I had that recently happen to me in the community where women started to talk um, in, um, in, um, in a very odd way about you know, me providing them pap smears, which I was like, what? But you know, that's sort of the same level. And so there's always a sexual component and we always have to be aware of it. Um, and, I just, um, and I just found that um, you know, when I get upset or something, you know, as usual, like I'm being hysterical, you know? So, I mean, it happens on so many levels. Um, and that's why, and, and if you go and look, um, one of our recent um, medical student who was here was surprised. He goes, I'm like the only man here you know, because it is run by women, but the people who, um, who, um, who may have the, the, the power um, may not be women or the people above the women who have power above them, those guys are men. I mean, it, it is, but, but at the very least, it is an Indian act system, it's hierarchical, and it does not jive with us trying to provide holistic wraparound services to our people. So yes, it's a huge problem even in um, you know, traditional matrilineal mat uh, um, cultures like, like us, the, the Mohawks, the Haudenosaunee. Uh, thank you. Lanny uh, was making, uh, had some comments and is invited to speak if that is possible. Um, and maybe while we're just checking to see if that's possible, um, we could, uh, uh, James, you had your hand up. Sure, thank you. Um, what an amazing presentation. I'll just, uh, thank you so much for inviting us. And I just want to acknowledge your family because you have such an amazing family and your mom is, you know, is do, did an amazing job. So congratulations to your mom and everybody that's here. I wanted to answer your uh, Juanique's question, which is the question of your talk. And um, much like all of the indigenous physicians here probably, like not only do we have an, a desire to go back home, there's an immense community pressure for us to have a duty and obligation to help our people. So, um, and that's huge. Uh, so, when I went home, uh, I had worked in my reserve for, I lasted for two years. So you lasted much longer than that, I think. Um, and then I had to leave. Uh, and I remember one of the Indigenous physicians telling me as a medical student that you should not go work in your home community. And I was like, no, that's not true. Like, my community is different. Like, you know, they supported me through post-secondary and it's going to be great. And I'm going to take all these ideas and do amazing things. And um, I ended up leaving after two years because it was just very, very violent, I guess. And my resignation letter was like 15 pages long, like outlining all of the things that needed to be corrected to prevent um, harm because of the health system, as was mentioned, is, is, is so bad on the reserve. And um, so I left and I, I went to another community that had recruited me and said, we're, we're gonna let you do traditional medicine. You can do all of these things. Well, and then I lasted there for two years as well and then left um, because of, of many of the similar reasons. So now I've been, in another Cree community for five years, which is the longest time. But even at the beginning of the pandemic, um, when we talk about how lateral violence impacts, and it's really trauma, because we work with trauma on a daily basis. And um, last year at this time, I, we were worried, as you know, you were on the physicians group, about how COVID would be affecting um, our ceremonies. And you know our ceremonies are important for our governance and our health. 
And I had made the recommendations to, um, to five scenarios to make our ceremony safer. And um, from not having them to like, you know, adapting them and all these different things. And there's nobody that can do that but us. Because we go to ceremonies, we participate in them, we know the importance of them. And in spite of doing that, um, I was fired uh, by <laughs> the chief and one of the ceremonial leaders. And it was the grandmothers who, um, who reversed that decision. And so um, there's a lot, and I still work there. So there, it, it's very difficult. Um, and, the, and the main thing is because of the trauma and how that manifests in people's relationships and how it manifests in their lives. And when you're the only physician in a community with people who have lost their self agency and ability to look after themselves or even use our own indigenous health system, it's very overwhelming because as you mentioned, not only do we have to know the birthing ceremonies and the rites of passage and the adult ceremonies and the marriage ceremonies and the death ceremonies, all of which encompass family medicine, but we also have to do Western medicine. And so there's a double burden existing in an under-resourced setting with traumatized people with, uh, and you're the only one. <laughs> so the universities have a huge role to play in this. And in this case, Queens is in your territory. And you are serving like 15,000 people across possibly three jurisdictions. And I would, I would ask, you know, as a colleague on your behalf to Queens to really think about how, what role that you can play in terms of helping to build the capacity for Akwesasne and the other indigenous nations that your ter that your the university um, that you work at is on their territory. And I worry about Ojisto because there's only one of her. And um, based on all of our collective experience, someone can only do this for so long. <laughs> And, um, and she needs a lot of support. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and thank you so much for the conversation, Ojisto. Thank you. Yes, mom. Oh, I don't know. I don't see who's next. No. And Monique, it's me. Yeah, Monique. Monique and then your mom. Okay. Oh, Good. mom, you wanna go first? <laughs> and she is my mom, but I just wanted to follow up to what James has to say. I, so my husband is a physician and I live with him and I understand how he practices medicine and he's a family doctor, just like Ogisto works in multiple areas in the Ottawa area, but I see a very, very distinct difference between him and Ogisto. He's able to shut the computer. Like he, he's emotionally attached to his patients to a certain extent. You can't practice medicine without some sort of emotional investment in what you do. But he is like, he can shut the, the computer and it's done. And any folk, he can switch gears, which is sort of the, the Western, like European style of medicine. It was like, yeah, the doctors, like they stopped and it was a, it was a profession. What I, in watching Ojista go to medical school and practice in two Mohawk communities where she's related to everybody, it's, 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 be, it's the word lifestyle doesn't encompass what it is. It's much, much more. And because, but I also, if I could say it, these doctors who have this ability to straddle the two worlds are the new generation of family care, primary care and communities, because they're emerging into this new way that we need in our communities. We need it. We have to have it. If we are going to get that, like what uh, Dr. Hill said, that self-efficacy, that will, that internal motivation to heal ourselves, we need to see in our medicine people, we need to see them being able to straddle those, those two worlds. We need that. 
And that's that ownership over our own well being. And so, you know, I also saw a very disempowered Ojisto. See, I look at Keith, my husband, and he rules, like, not, not in a mean way, but he, everybody listens to him. Everybody in his clinic listens to him. The nurses, the owners, the, the pharmacists, every single person listens to him. He's the ultimate authority and he knows it. Comes home, nobody listens to him. And he's always saying that, but because it's a Mohawk house. But <laughs> I would say that one of the things that physicians and I think many, many people coming home to community is um, there's no human rights in our communities. And there's, and, and these doctors have no protection whatsoever. And the inability to protect and speak up for family, the inability, because what I feel these doctors do, they are the ones that mop up. You guys are mopping up the disaster of colonization. That's what you do. You're dealing with the addictions, you're dealing with the abuse, you're dealing with all of it. And you carry these, you carry all of the stories, you carry all of the knowledge, you carry all the secrets of all of these, what's happening in these communities and you can do nothing about it except treat and try to get them through it. And so, you know, as Ojisto's little sister, you know, we, we always have done things as family. You know, my family is all on here. We are a team, we're like warriors. And what the hardest thing for her was is she couldn't help me, you know? And so I wanna find, I've been, me and my sisters have been trying, struggling to find a way to help her. Queens, McGill, Ottawa U, you cannot ask more of my sister, but we are here to help you any way we can. My sister, if you ask more of her, you will burn her out. And I'm the person that's standing here as her warrior little sister saying, you can't do that to her. But you can ask me, you can ask people around her. We know we can provide support. We can do the legwork for her. We can pick her brain. We can do all that stuff, but you cannot ask her to do it because she is supposed to provide care She's supposed to be a doctor. She's not supposed to fix. She's not supposed to fix the universities. That's not her job. Her job is to be a doctor. But all of us around her, all of her family members, she has a professor sister. She has, well, me, you know, I'm, I work in consultation. She has a lot of people around her that can help you. So I'm just saying this in a way that I, I want to be there to help you. And I'm willing to offer my hand as part of her warrior staff, but I will, uh, I will not let you burn her out. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Uh, Mar Mom. Oh, well, I've had a long life. I'm now in my uh, ninth decade, I guess. And uh, I've gone through a lot and a lot of the uh, problems I've had, and people that stood in my way. And uh, I've, found out uh, through um, a lot of uh, research and material that's uh, found in the government and on the kind of uh, tactics that were used against me to immobilize me and, uh, and put me out of uh, commission for, well, 40 years I've been blacklisted. Well, that's the system that that we're fighting and I fought that system. I tried really, really hard. And, um, and um, they have, a, the, the, the councils have had their job to do. They're following the Indian Act. If you know that Indian Act and you ever read it, you'd see that, that they're there to carry out the will and the wishes of the Canadian government. I've known that and I've, I've, I've tried so hard all my life to fight it. And I, I don't know if I was successful. They did knock me out of the picture for a long time. And so what I had always wanted to do was to find a way to reach 
they, they put the power of making decisions about everything in our communities to these politicians. And these politicians are not really politicians, as you know, they're people that are, you know, uh, they become a, the chief and, and the man council, and then they carry out uh, whatever they have to carry out, you know, uh, uh, going along with uh, the, um, the, the politics and going along with whatever it is, you know, the, that the government wants done. They have their own ideas about what they want, and they know that. And so, the, so we have man council, and that's, they have been my number one uh, uh, enemies. They've done a lot of things to me. And I have a lot of information, you know, it, it's all in the archives, it's all in the Department of Indian Affairs, it's all in there what they've done. Now, how do you, how do you get around that? And the only thing I can think of is that you have find some way that you talk to these band councils, you get them together and you tell them what, how hard it is for you to take care of them. Because in a lot of cases, uh, Logisto's uh, clients are some of these very people. And, uh, and so there's, there's gotta be a way that you can talk to these people and tell them, look, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're trying to do. And we're going to help you, all of you, but you must help us. You can't stand in the way. You can't be doing things behind our backs and you can't be making all kinds of wheeling and dealing and taking you know, all that money that's supposed to go to health or, or not just health, but you know, there's all kinds of other money there that they keep, they're throwing at us right now, actually. And, uh, and they tell you, oh yeah, yeah, it's there, it's all there for you. And then you try and get some of it and you don't get, you, you don't get it. <laughs> It goes to some people, but the people that are, you know, not uh, looked in uh, in a favorable way, well, too bad for you, you know. So that I'm just saying that I, I became educated, you know, I went to school, I I got educated, and then that was held against me. People were uh, used it against me and made fun of me and and and, and put me down as much as they could. And uh, so I had to go into the background and hide and, and do whatever I had to do. And uh, I'm not sure if I accomplished what I, I, I hope I did accomplish and did some good. But the main thing I think is that we gotta now um, go after the band councils and get them on our side. And how do you do that? Well, you gotta bring them in. You got to talk to them. I, I, I don't think you have to hold back anymore. I mean, they're the ones do. They're the ones with the power to do what what's happening right now in our communities. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have uh, the know how, and they're in there, and they've got this big bag of money, and they're the ones that uh, decide who gets it and who doesn't get it. So I'm just telling you that we that there are many band counselors that work very hard and fight very hard for 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 the people for their people but there are a lot of them oh and i used to work on indian affairs for 20 years and i know the kind of training they give to these band counselors i know it and i know what they do to stop any progress in the in the communities and keep us ignorant keep us keep our uh, communities uh you know lingering and and bad water bad this bad that you know they're still doing that so, so Mom, i think i think we have to turn around and start talking to these people i agree thank you, thank you mom i just wanted to ask um dr cook what you wanted to say Well, first, I just wanted to apologize for being late. There was a big storm in Manitoba, as you all know, and I had to run into Winnipeg. So I hoped to be home at four, but I got home a little bit late. And I must say, you know, uh, I spent six and a half years in Aquasasne, but I had a lot more help than Adjusto has now. 
you know, there was, there was three other doctors who were coming in, family physicians, as well as my, I was the only full-time one. And, and, um, you know, I, I, I just loved it there. And, and, but I think it's different because I wasn't from Akwesasne. So, you know, I had a little bit of trouble with uh, working with a traditional healing program because they would always say, you don't understand because you're not Moha. But the executive director would always say to me, I just thank God you're not Moha. <laughs> she says, because it's like fresh air, you know, the the because I'm Cree. So, um, and I went to my home community and I, I went back when I was 61. So, and I think it makes a big difference because I went back there as an, uh, an older person and I wasn't going to say elder, <laughs> but, and, and they, and like the community welcomed me, but up until that point, I wasn't ready to go home. You know, I just, I'm related to everybody like, you know, the, what the, the doctors were talking about. And I just thought it'd be too difficult to run codes on people who were my siblings or, but I, I went home when my sister was dying of, of colon cancer because I wanted to be with her. And so I was there and helped my brother-in-law take care of her. And it was one of the best things that I ever did, except, but with being in a small community by yourself, I was on call four nights a week. A week and I went up there three weeks a month. So I was on call 12 nights a month and it just got to be my old body couldn't take call anymore. So I had to leave, but I am going back to do locums. But it was interesting because the elders thanked me for coming home because you know the, the health system was not set up properly. And I just you know got the team together and I had them doing everybody's blood pressure weights. and. They thanked me when I was leaving and they said, thank you for doing that because before that, nobody was checking our blood pressures and our weights and our, you know, our blood sugars and that. So I had a positive experience going home, but I, I, I left there again in 2019 when I was 67, but now I'm going to do locums up there. So thank you. And I'm sorry I was late at just though, but I, it was a great discussion. Thank you. There is actually so much to say. We mm -hmm. And a year talking every week with uh, many of the with many with, with now I have friends colleagues to talk about this experience of um, trying to live um, and work in your own home. Um, it, I'll have to say that I had a really really hard time trying to figure out what I wanted to tell you, and that's why I know that this is just the beginning of a very very huge conversation. Um, that, um, that, 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 that I would love to have more doctors one day to be able to talk about this. Um, but right now, you know, there's a good eight, nine, 10 of us and we talk regularly and it's wonderful. Um, and I, I just thank um, all of my family and, um, and, and these um, colleagues of, of mine um, that have uh, made um, my life a lot more, uh, just a lot more easier. Um, is there any, I don't think, do we have any more time? I, I think, I, I think this could go on for a very long time. And, and I, I think this is the, hopefully the beginning of a conversation, um, that, uh, we will enter into in good faith and, um, work, work with you and, and your family. And so th I just wanted to, uh, on behalf of the, the organizing committee and everyone who's gathered here today, thank you um, for uh, for your courage in in uh, having this conversation with us and sharing what you have shared with us. And uh, thank you, thank you for this, and thank you to your family. Thank you very much. And I have a comment here from Courtney. If you can find your way to me, um, I would be happy to talk to you um, separately. Um, or you could um, get in touch with um, with um, the people at Queens, and they can give um, my contacts, and uh, we can continue to have this conversation in a big sphere and in a small sphere. Thank you very much. Thank you. Meow, go watch Ojesta. Say, Ona. Ona. And Love I, you, my doctors, my native doctors. You guys are rock stars. See you. Thank you. Thank you. 
<sighs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, 